Shabbatalo family. Hope everybody's enjoying your Shabbat day, even though the world is in utter chaos. And just have to abide in the law and the fruits of the spirit, believe in the Nalahayim, trust in the Nalahayim, and knowing that he's going to deliver us. So we just constantly stay in prayer for everybody. It's a great time for self-examination. Great time to humble yourself and to truly buckle down in, in the good things of Alahayim and just wait on him to do his good pleasure toward us and strengthen us in, in good works. So, welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Zakwa. And I'm your brother Kasafo. We greet you and we thank you for for joining us and congregating with us this day. And we hope the information is edifying. Uh, we are going into the tribe of Joseph today. So we hope you definitely enjoy the lesson. Uh, if you haven't seen the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, to Dan, Naphtali, it will be great to catch up on those tribes and this tribe of Joseph that we're about to go into today. All right. Kasa, you ready? Yes, the 10 tribes predominantly went to the region of Osiris, which was the islands of the Indian Ocean, the Americans, and the Caribbean islands. They are known as aboriginals, indigenous, or natives of those lands and islands. Today, the 10 tribes are scattered across the world, so they are not regulated to being in one specific area of the world right now. The 10 tribes consist of Reuben, Simeon, Dan, Naphtali, Issachar, Zebulon, Gad, Asher, Ephraim, and Manasseh. In one's personal search for one's tribal origin, one must start by prayer because we have to make our request known with supplication. Then one has to look at our father's lineage to know our tribes according to the scriptures like Numbers 1 and 2. If one's ancestry stems back to the slaves, Negroes, or the Bantus of Africa, or the cargo slave ships, then one is more than likely from the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, or Levi, with a slim chance of Simeon or the Ten Tribes. On the other hand, if one's ancestry stems back to any Native American or indigenous people of the Americas and Caribbeans and the aboriginals or indigenous tribes of the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, then you are from the 10 tribes of Israel. This series of lessons are to identify 12 tribes individually according to the spiritual indicators that the patriarchs documented their children would face. We know the signs and curses that help identify the children of Israel around the world today from prior lessons, yet through the spiritual indicators in the admonitions of the patriarchs, one can identify which specific tribe or person of the house of Israel originates from. It is by the Spirit that Haya has given the grace to truly identify which tribe people actually come from, since it is she that brings things to remembrance, searcheth all things, and we cannot know anything except the Spirit reveal them. You can reference scriptures in John 16 and 13, 14 and 26. And also 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, to understand how the Spirit works. Now getting into identifying the tribe of Joseph. Jacob testified of the good and the bad that will befall the posterity of Joseph. Brother Zachar, can you read Genesis 49 and 22 to 26, please? Joseph is a fruitful boat even a fruitful bow by a whale, whose branches run over the wall. This was foretelling of how he will grow forth in abundance. So it's a metaphoric speech of the fruitful seed of the children of Joseph. Exactly. What was it with the fruitful bow by a whale? Can you explain um, that part? When a plant or whatever it is, whatever your, your gardening is, is planted by water, it it sprouts and it brings forth more abundantly than it being planted off a loaf somewhere uh, away from water. So what he was describing was he was going to sprout forth abundantly. Like he was going to be a well-nurtured plant that was going to, uh, or a bow that was going to sprout forth. So. Right, and 
and that has come to pass. And you see the many of Ephraim and Manasseh, because that's all the house of Joseph. Continue reading, please. And the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Okay. The archers are referring to the nations. When the nations came for the ten tribes in the regions of Osirath, the children of Joseph down in the greater Antilles, where Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico, they were the first ones met by the colonizers, and they were afflicted very much when you read the history of what is known as the American Holocaust. The nations have afflicted him, but his seed would make it out of the affliction. But his bow abode in strength. Then we see his seed continued, though they were afflicted. And as we know the history, of, we've seen what happened with the ten tribes in the scriptures, with the afflictions of the Assyrian Empire and whatnot, and also in, in latter times with the uh, conquering of the Americas. And even to this day, what's going on down in the islands. Happening. Yet, Yahya foretold that his bow will abide in strength. They will still continue. Uh, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty Elohim of Jacob. This showed that his seed would make it out of the affliction, though they may think that it's by their strength or by their wisdom, when in truth, it's just Elohim's mercy that's delivering them. It's the hands of the mighty one that's keeping them through all these things. <laughs> Continue, please. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And that's letting us know exactly who's really keeping them. Is Yache, the rock, the foundation of our faith, the great shepherd. Continue verse 25, please. Even by the Elohim of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessing of thy father, I prevailed above the blessing of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Joseph's blessing is greater than the blessings of the progenitors because not only did he receive the blessings of the heaven and the deep, but he also has the blessings of the breast and of the womb, so that he'll be plenteous. They shall Continue be on please. the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So we see in the latter days, Joseph's children will be afflicted, yet they would still be plenteous and abide in strength because Joseph has the blessing of a womb. So here in these latter times, his children are still plenteous according to the blessings of their father. And a part of identifying them is that there are people known for having big families and you'll find them bunched up together all in one area, <laughs> like a fruitful boat. Let's jump to Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 13 to 17 to hear the blessings that Moses spake over the children of Joseph. Deuteronomy 33 and 13. And of Joseph he said, Blessed of Ahia be his land, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that crouches beneath. So this applied to Ephraim and Manasseh who did indeed have a blessed land. They had the land of Ephraim, the land of Bashan. If, if you look at the scripture, see they had a great possession among the children of Israel. And also they continued living in a blessed area, predominantly in the Caribbean islands. It's rich. This is actually where I was from in the Caribbean. So there's it's a lot of good things down there. And I had continued that blessing upon them. Continue, please. And for the precious fruits, brought forth by the sun and for the and that, that was funny by the moon. that was interesting seeing that their land they continued in a blessed land you remember Zach what we talked about Kenip yeah, <laughs> the precious things brought forth by the sun these are things that I don't know if it's found anywhere else other than down in Ireland in South America area the areas where Joseph and they will end up in the times Continue, please. And of course, we know that land was blessed. Reuben had the mandrakes when they were in the land of Canaan. And continue, please. And for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills. Joseph's children are very resourceful. As you see, speaking of the things in the mountains and the precious things of the lasting hills, just letting you know that Joseph's children they have a tendency for living off the land. They are what we would know today. They have the green thumb. They flourish in that environment. As farmers, 
and they prospered so well. Also, according to the Testament of Judah, chapter 24, it tells of how the mountains bless Joseph. So the children of Joseph have a comfortability, they have a connection with the mountains and hills, and you'll find even in the islands where they're at, predominantly, they have a inclination to live in the mountains or the hill areas, or in the countryside. Even as in scripture, the children of Joseph had Mount Ephraim and the wooded mountains for their inheritance, according to Joshua chapter 17. Now they are scattered throughout the earth, yet they may take comfort in being in those places, according to the blessings that they've been given and the connection that they have with it. It may be something as simple as it relaxes them when they're in the countryside or up in the mountains or something like that. Continue, please. And for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. The person that dwelt in the bush was Yahweh, the angel that met Moses in the burning bush. That's who Moses is referring to here. So it's for Yahweh's good will that Joseph is receiving these blessings. And continue reading Zachariah in Deuteronomy 33 and 16. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separate from his brother. You see who Moses was really speaking to. It's interesting, when speaking of Joseph, it always goes back to Yahweh. He is the head, right? Yahweh is the head of every man. Continue. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Now, we spoke of being the first sons of the bullock. We know from what transpired, Joseph has been given the birthright. He is the firstborn. And that helps understand why Ahaya prospered him so much and would prosper see because they are the firstborn of the house of Israel. And we saw where he spoke of him that dwelt in the bush, knowing that now he's talking about Yache, where he says his horns are like the horns of unicorn. You can refer back to the vision of Naphtali and in the visions of Joseph where you saw the bullock with the horns. Two horns are referring to the two witnesses that stand before the Elohim of the whole earth, which is Yache. And what is Yache going to do with those two horns? If we continue reading, please. With them, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. He's using the two witnesses to bring them together. And Joseph also plays a part. Because in the vision Joseph had, in his testament, there was a third horn that came up after the two. And even as in the days of Exodus, there was Moses and Aaron. And then that third horn was Joshua. Even so, in the end times, Joseph's seed is going to have a part to play for the guidance and deliverance of the children of Israel. All right. Continue, please. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. That fruitful bow. That blessing of the womb that's above the blessings of the progenitors. As I have foretold, they are going to be fruitful here in these end times as well. And of course, in the kingdom, when the children of Israel shall be multiplied as the stars of heaven, it will be no surprise <laughs> that Joseph's children will probably have more than anybody else. <laughs> See, it is though their blessings to be fruitful. Right. So, continuing going into understanding Joseph. As we discuss the lesson on Naphtali, it was shown that Joseph and Naphtali were like each other, even as Naphtali attested. So we can understand a lot about Joseph from the Testament of Naphtali. So we would encourage Joseph's children to use wisdom and go hear that admonition of Naphtali for guidance as well. Uh, can you read Testament of Naphtali, chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, please? Well, Rachel loved me very much because I was born upon her lap. And when I was still young, she would want to kiss me and say, May I have a brother of thine from my own womb, like unto thee. Whence also Joseph was like unto me in all things, according to the prayers of Rachel. From Naphtali's testament, it was shown that Joseph's tribe would struggle with disorderliness and scorn, high-mindedness, and doing things out of season. Among other things, which can be understood through watching the whole lesson on Naphtali. So please reference that lesson on Naphtali to understand the struggles you would face, children of Joseph, and also how to overcome them. Now, we're going to go into the testament of Joseph itself here, and may I hire a guy to help 
Joseph's children get understanding of how they may come back to the righteousness of their father through the stone of Israel, our Lord Yache. All right, Zach, well. Uh, the Testament of Joseph, chapter 1, verse 1. The copy of the Testament of Joseph, when he was about to die, he called his sons and his brethren together and said to them, My brethren and my children, hearken to Joseph, the beloved of Israel. Give ear, my sons, unto your father. I have seen in my life envy and death, yet I went not astray, but persevered in the truth of Ahiah. So there we see, for Joseph, he did have to overcome envy. And we see how he overcame through persevering in the truth of Ahiah. He didn't go astray. So that his children to this day can know what is key for them to overcome the spirit of envy. But your father showed that he had to face it. And also Naphtali had told also how Joseph from the visions that it would be envy. And jealousy towards Judah and Levi. That would cause Joseph to stumble. So children of Joseph have to be very mindful of that. And it's honestly not a light thing dealing with envy because the Proverbs tell how envy is worse than wrath and anger. And you can see that it's a real thing to focus on and it takes time to overcome. Because Joseph said he persevered through the truth to overcome these things. And Simeon, it took him two years of fasting in righteousness to overcome envy. So children of Joseph have to really buckle down and focus on overcoming that spirit. And you have edification in the lesson on Levi, part one, overcoming envy. And also if you feel to watch the lesson on Simeon as well for edification on overcoming envy. Can you read the Testament of Nathu so you can see that part in chapter 5, verse 3 to... 3 to 5 and chapter 6, verse 2 to 8. Okay, thanks. Uh, Testament of Naphtali, chapter 5, verse 3. And Levi and Judah set upon the two masts to look out which way the ship was to take. As long as Joseph and Judah were of one mind, and Judah showed Joseph which was the right way, Joseph directed thither the ship, and the ship sailed on peaceably without hindrance. What you see here, he said they were of one mind. They had the one doctrine. Judah and Levi, of course, Judah was known to be a lawgiver. And Levi, of course, he had to teach the guidance to give Joseph understanding. So long as they were on that one doctrine, they were always going the right way. And they were going peaceably without hindrance. And see how brotherly love prospered when everything was done in order. Because the king and the priests would lead tribes. And the firstborn would set the example because he's the oldest of all. And he's ought to set the example for everyone else. And it makes sense why Joseph teaches his children to walk with the fear of Allah before them and to cleave to Judah and Levi so that they can actually set the example for the rest of the tribes how we ought to walk, being that they are firstborn. Continue, please. And after a while, a quarrel arose between Joseph and Judah. And Joseph no longer steered the ship according to the words of his father and the teachings of Judah, and the ship went a wrong course. And the waves of the seas dashed it on a rock so that ship was broken up and we know from scriptures that that discord comes through envy and naphtali is going to touch on it as he goes through it so that we know to avoid that and walk in brotherly love honoring our brother honoring our neighbor and loving our neighbor as ourselves so that we stay on the one page uh, the testament of naphtali chapter 6 verse 2 and behold, there came Jacob our father, and found us dispersed, one here and another there. He said unto us, What is the matter with you, my sons? Perhaps you have not steered the ship as we ought, even as I commanded you. And we said unto him, By the life of thy servant, we have not departed from anything that thou hast commanded us. But Joseph transgressed against the command, for he did not steer the ship according to thy command. And as he was instructed by Levi and Judah, for he was jealous of them. And he said unto us, Show me the place of the ship. And he saw, and behold, the tops of the mast were visible. And behold, it was floating upon the surface of the water. And my father whistled, and we all gathered round him. And he cast himself into the sea as before, and he repaired the ship. 
And he reproved Joseph and said unto him, My son, thou shalt not again deceive nor be jealous of thy brothers, for they were nearly lost through thee. We see how jealousy affected the children of Joseph. The deceiving comes when they speak vain words with ill intent to get what they want instead of doing it with good intent for the help of someone else. They'll speak vain words for their own gain or something they desire. Like Jeroboam, what he did when he gave the children of Israel new ordinances to prevent them from going down to Jerusalem like they were commanded. And his intent wasn't good because he just did it so that he wouldn't lose his authority or the glory he had over the people. Now, on the other hand, when they work righteousness, they would use goodly words, just like Naphtali, to lead people onto righteousness. By example, you have Joshua with his exhortations, Samuel and Gideon, the son of Manasseh, who also spoke goodly words to exhort people to the righteousness, to obedience to the law. You'll find the children of Joseph like Joshua and Samuel, they aren't talkative using few words to speak of good things for the comfort of others unto righteousness, even as Naphtali exhorted. On the other hand, the children of Joseph, when in unrighteousness, they're talkative and they don't talk in due season and their intent is impure, seen as though they're speaking for something that will benefit them. And the words are vain, not for the edification or help of others, but just for the attention it brings or glorying in themselves whether it be about the knowledge they know or something of that sort and this understanding comes from the lesson on Naphtali which you can refer back to through this struggle the children of Joseph are the types where they have to dominate the conversation or whatever is being talked about they have to turn the conversation and bring it back to being about themselves just to give an example in common interactions in Naphtali's vision, he saw Joseph struggle with pride, and then Joseph being just like Naphtali, there's a struggle with being haughty, prideful, and high-minded into themselves. So it looks like the pride of wanting that glory or thinking so highly of themselves is what gives place to the jealousy to stir them up that they're not getting the attention so they do whatever they feel they have to do or say to get that attention as you've seen with Jeroboam this jealousy causes Joseph's children to transgress by evidence of the men of Ephraim as well quarreling with Gideon because they didn't get to come get the glory of overcoming those people in the war and Abimelech the son of Manasseh killing his brethren so that he may be ruler of the Shechemites you can see how it affects all Joseph's children, as the Testament tells. And they're exhorted to avoid covetousness because it leads them into corrupting their doings. With the children of Joseph for understanding how they fall out of the brotherly love through that spirit of envy. Naphtali had told them in Naphtali chapter 3 verse 1, he said, Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness or vain words to beguile your souls. Covetousness or the things they desire cause the children of Joseph to be hasty in their thoughts and actions, being quick to look at things according to their own mind and or speak rashly instead of being silent with purity of heart as Naphtali commands so that they can take their time and assess and see things according to the will of Allah I am. So, this covetousness unto hastiness sets a stumbling block for them to fall into envy. And from the testament of Gad, it was told in Gad chapter 4, verse 7, that the spirit of hatred worketh together with Satan through hastiness of spirit in all things to men's death. Through hatred and envy, the children of Joseph are what you call today haters. They struggle with hating on each other and hating on other folks. With the hatred of heart, they easily get in their feelings to be envious of another. Because Testament of Dan chapter 2 says, in reference to anger, 
wherewith does encompass it in his eyes with hatred of heart so as to be envious of his brother so how it works they'll desire something they'll cover after something and it'll cause them to be hasty and in the high-mindedness or the pride being scornful looking down upon others when they see someone else has it or getting more attention than themselves they'll be vexed and then anger works through the net of deceit to blind their eyes to hate that person and be envious of them you'll find among the children of Joseph hatred and envy whether it be among friends among family and even in relationships they treat each other badly and this is all a part of the disorderliness that we talked about in the lesson on Naphtali that you can revisit for edification. So you can see how that covetousness making them hasty causes Joseph's children to envy with hatred of heart. So Joseph's children have to be very mindful of avoiding that quick desire. So I Naphtali attested of being silent in purity of heart that ye may know the will of Allah I am. and Gad spoke about overcoming hatred by the spirit of love working with the law of Allah I am in long suffering so you have to love one another being long suffering towards others instead of being vexed or getting angry or getting in your feelings when things aren't the way you want it to be or the way you think it should be and keeping your tongue taking your time and think about things to make sure your heart is pure with your thoughts and with your inclination and what you're thinking to speak so that what you speak and what you do will be with good intent and you won't fall into the irascibility through covetousness to hate on be envious or jealous of another or to rail on someone being rash with the tongue you'll find the children of Joseph are known as being hot hot tempered even as the book of Hosea references them in chapter 7 as being hot as an oven through hatred and irascibility if someone says something to them they're quick to snap or get agitated quickly or respond with an attitude and the cure for these things is in James chapter 1 verse 19 to 20 it says wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak slow to wrath for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of Allah Hayyam. if they do these things in love with long suffering being silent with purity of heart before speaking with the fear of Allah Hayyam before their eyes Allah Hayyam be gracious they can overcome these struggles be temperate be sober minded and have self control and not be jumpy but to take that time and assess things thoroughly to make sure they don't give heed to any evil desire which would lead them to end up not walking in love with each other as we seen with Jeroboam I had told him if he do us right he'll have ten tribes yet in his eagerness he just thought about oh if they go to Jerusalem they're not gonna come back and he made up his own plan according to his own mind to lead him astray so Joseph's children have to be very mindful of these things now let's continue the testament of joseph in chapter one we're at verse four yeah. let's continue there and see how ahaya delivered joseph these my brethren hated me but ahaya loved me they wished to slay me but the alahim of my father guarded me they let me down into a pit and the most high brought me up again i was sold into slavery and the adono of all made me free i was taken into captivity and his strong hand to court me. I was beset with hunger, and Ahiah himself nourished me. I was alone, and Alahim comforted me. I was sick, and Ahiah visited me. I was in prison, and my Alahim showed favor unto me. In bonds, and he released me. Slandered, and he pleaded my cause. Bitterly spoken against by the Egyptians, and he delivered me envied by my fellow slaves and he exalted me why did joseph go into that everything was about what allah Hayyam did something was done to him and allah Hayyam brought him out allah Hayyam saved him these things was his way of 
leading his children to understand that Allah Hayyam delivers from all things so that they wouldn't trust in themselves whether it be their ability their wisdom or their own perspective on things but to wait on Allah Hayyam and trust in work and righteousness that he will deliver even as Joseph had to learn from his own experience because we learn from Testament and Nafti that Nafti and Joseph's children struggle with trust in themselves they trust in their strength I mean their wisdom Joseph didn't speak oh I did this to get out of it you know I got out by this means I got out by that means is what Ahaya did there was no glory in himself he had been brought to that place of humility where he understood and trusted that it was Allah Hayyam that delivered and keep him in all things. So it's key for Joseph's children to overcome their trust in themselves. And you can also see that Joseph himself had to go through this. This was a process that he came to understand this. He himself had to learn to trust in Allah Hayyam from his experience when he trusted in the butler to save him instead of Allah Hayyam. In Jasher chapter 46, verse 19. You can read that, please. And the butler to whom Joseph had interpreted his dream forgot Joseph. And he did not mention him to the king as he had promised. For this thing was from Ahiah in order to punish Joseph because he trusted in man. And we see Joseph's children have to overcome trusting in men, which also means trusting in themselves. Right. His sons would struggle with trusting in themselves instead of Allah Hayyam in the scriptures as well and acting hastily out of order, not doing things according to the testimonies. Uh, let's look at Jasher chapter 75, verse 1 to 5, please. At that time, in the 180th year of the Israelites going down into Egypt, there went forth from Egypt valiant men, 30,000 on foot, from the children of Israel, who were all of the tribe of Joseph of the children of Ephraim, Joseph's sons. For they said the period was completed, which Ahiah had appointed to the children of Israel in the times of old, which he had spoken to Abraham. See there, they said, Joseph their father had told them to hearken to Judah and Levi. Yet his sons said they went out of order. They declared it themselves. They went according to their own mind. Hence they fell. You can see how this was something that the children of Joseph had to be mindful of. And these men girded themselves, and they put each man his sword at his side, and every man his armor upon him, and they trusted on their strength. And there you see Ephraim put aside the words of their father to hearken to Judah and Levi, trusting in their own strength, to establish their own understanding. Rather than cleaving to Allah Hayyam submitting themselves to the proper order of things and they went out together from egypt with a mighty hand there we see the shortcomings of the sons of joseph and thankfully through joseph's admonitions and talking of his experiences we can see how the sons of joseph overcome when they cleave and trust in Allah Hayyam and wait on his deliverance not trusting in men or themselves now when his children are in righteousness they do all things by counsel inquiring of Allah Hayyam like joshua and samuel Gideon also, son of Manasseh, also had good success when he inquired of Allah Hayyam before acting. Interestingly, Joshua, an Ephraimite, and Gideon, son of Manasseh, their mistakes came when they acted without the counsel of Allah Hayyam. Like when Joshua received the Gibeonites, they said they had sinned in this thing because they didn't inquire of Allah Hayyam before making their agreement with them. And then Gideon, he had made the ephod, which was a snare unto him. Other than that, they did well. And then you have the example of Samuel. Samuel didn't make any mistakes because he inquired with everything. <laughs> he walked with the fear of Allah before his eyes. So you can get to see scripturally how what Joseph talked about and what the testimony showed really does prosper or cause struggle for the children of Joseph. Of course, you know Jeroboam and what he did on the other end where he just went according to his own understanding without inquiring of Allah Hayyam before acting. And when he did inquire, it was only when the situation was something he couldn't control himself. So you can see the dichotomies of Joseph's children prospering when they walk with the fear of Allah Hayyam before their eyes, like Samuel, and listen to the good instruction of Judah. And Levi. Like Joshua did through Moses. And Eleazar. All right, let's continue, please. And this chief captain of Pharaoh entrusted me 
to his house. And I struggled against a shameless woman, urging me to transgress with her. But the Allah of Israel, my father, delivered me from the burning flame. That burning flame was from the spirit of fornication. This is important to understand for the children of Joseph because they also struggle with fornication. But the way they struggle with it is different than how others may struggle. We'll get understanding of that as we continue, please. I was cast into prison, I was beaten, I was mocked, but Ahaya granted me to find mercy in the sight of the keeper of the prison, for Ahaya doeth not forsake them that fear him, neither in darkness, nor in bonds, nor in tribulations, nor in necessities. It is a great thing for the children of Joseph to walk in the fear of Allah. You see, your father is constantly talking about what Allah did for him. Ahaya did this, Ahaya did that, Ahaya caused this to happen, you know, Yache did this. It's for the children of Joseph to really get away from glory in themselves, thinking it's their wisdom or their strength by which they're being delivered. Taking matters into their own hands and walking according to their own mind for them to see that trusting in the fear of Ahaya and assessing everything, their thoughts, their mode of actions, to see if it's according to the fear of Ahaya, regardless of situation, knowing that if they walk in his fear, they'll be delivered, understanding that it's his grace with them to deliver them, not any wisdom of their own or any strength of their own in that humility and being content in that wisdom is essential for them. And you can confirm the fear of Allah is all you need in simplicity because Ahaya gave Joshua a simple command when setting him over the people. In Joshua 1 and 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's the simplicity of what the children of Joseph need to do. Continue, please. But Allah is not put to shame as a man. Nor as the son of man is he afraid, nor as one that is earth-born is he weak or frightened. But in all things doeth he give protection, and in diverse ways doeth he comfort, though for a little space he departeth to try the inclination of the soul. In ten temptations he showed me approved, and in all of them I endured. For in no this, he said, is a mighty charm. Patience giveth many good things. Right. It's amazing. He said, he showed me approved. It's Ahaya that made it happen. Joseph just had to endure and wait on the deliverance in every trial. There's a difference. To be reprobate is to not endure the trial, right? Not fit for the test. Right. So you can see, Joseph, children, you have to be very mindful. As your father endured, he did not turn away. And therefore, there's a temptation for the children of Joseph to be tempted to turn away in trials, not to endure it with patience. Endurance is the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. This shows the children of Joseph struggle with tolerance, suffering, forbearance, or long suffering. When in tight situations, they get angered easily or get frustrated and give way to doing the wrong thing or making the wrong decision or growing impatient with the situation and acting on that frustration and it causes them to stumble whereas Joseph endured everything and was patient waiting on Allah deliverance and not trusting in himself or trusting in man to deliver him. It'll help the children of Joseph to practice acquiescence 
to accept the will of Allah without protest and to walk in acceptance, the willingness to tolerate a difficult or unpleasant situation, knowing that it's Allah will and everything that comes is for the best and is what's good for their growth. That should help with not getting frustrated or growing jealous or envious of a situation or giving heed to any anger or being vexed about what's going on in the afflictions that they're facing. That's important to have that patience to endure this change because Joseph's children struggle with high-mindedness, pride, being scornful. The process of being brought unto Yache is chasing you to humility. You're being shown your sins. It's a process of showing all the struggles that you actually have. So that temptation of being high-minded, it makes it very susceptible to become reprobate and turn back and not endure the trial patiently to be brought to the place where Yachik can dwell. Because the ego will keep you in a place where you won't be able to be honest with yourself in assessing the things you really have going on within your heart. And the ego will keep you from repenting of things done wrong. Children of Joseph have to be very mindful of that. And trust in the process of being brought to the place where Yachi can dwell in our hearts. Endurance is a key. We've been going over the things that Joseph's children face, and one of the big things for deliverance is endurance. Wait on Allah. You see, your father went through, what was it, 12 years? Yeah. Basically, he was again afflicted 12 years before he got delivered. Right. 12 years, your father went through it. So, you know, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing that it worketh patience. Count it all cheer when you're brought to low estate. Your father did the same. So this, may this help you, sons and daughters of Joseph out there. Now, going into this testament, if for those of you that read it before, you notice Joseph went a great length to explain all the things that that Egyptian woman had tried to do to him to get him to fall to fornication. And there was a great purpose for Joseph going into the detail about his struggles against the shameless woman because he had to overcome fornication in his mind. So he left a testament for his sons to understand the diverse ways one can be tempted and how Ahaya delivers if one's truly seeking to have self-control in the fear of Allah through prayer and fasting and patience. Hopefully this really helps his children. Uh, can you read the Testament of Reuben, chapter 4, verse 8 to 11, please? For ye heard regarding Joseph, how he guarded himself from a woman, and purged his thoughts from all fornication. In a mental fight that Joseph had to go through, I'll let you know Joseph's children, fornication attacks them more in the mind than outwardly. Yet also the improper use of their body causes them to use their body as a means to get attention or get what they want or use their beauty as a tool to accomplish their endeavor or flaunting themselves through the pride and being into themselves which can be a product of the spirit of fornication working against them in their minds because fornication leads people to adorn themselves with the wrong intent and this understanding of the issue with improper use of the body and such comes from the testament of Naphtali and what he explained his children face. Again, you can reference that lesson for further understanding. Continue, please. But ye heard regarding Joseph, how he guarded himself from a woman, and purged his thoughts from all fornication, and found favor in the sight of Allah and the man. But the Egyptian woman did many things unto him, and summoned magicians, and offered him love potions. But the purpose of his soul admitted no evil desire. It was all an inward battle for him. She was trying his senses because Reuben told how fornication is seated in the senses. Yet he had to just overcome within. All right, continue. Therefore the Allah of your father delivered him from every evil and hidden death. For if fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can Belier overcome you. Hey, you notice he said Allah delivered him from every evil and hidden death. 
and he started off saying, I've seen envy and death in my life. The death was referring to the spirit of fornication. So that's exactly where it leads. Yeah, look at that. What the children of Joseph have to overcome, envy and fornication. That shows the chief things the children of Joseph face is envy and fornication, pride, being arrogant and scorn, as Naphtali showed, along with the struggle with disorderliness, whether it be in their doings or in their household, and misuse of the body, and the misuse of the mouth, being talkative without good intent, instead of being silent with a pure heart, waiting to know the will of Allah Hayyam, to speak with good intent for the comfort of others with words of righteousness. For fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can barely yet overcome you. Ahaya showing this inward fight for the children of Joseph. Testament of Joseph, chapter 3, verse 1. How often did the Egyptian woman threaten me with death? How often did she give me over to punishment and then call me back and threaten me? And when I was unwilling to company with her, she said to me, Thou shalt be master of me, and all that is in my house, thou would give thyself unto me, and thou shalt be as our master. Tempting him, tempting him with authority, tempting him with glory, with vanity. Continue, please. But I remembered the words of my father. And going into my chamber, I wept and prayed unto Ahia. In the book of Jubilees, chapter 39, verse 6 to 7, it tells of the words that Joseph remembered. It reads, But he did not surrender his soul, and he remembered Ahia, and the words which Jacob, his father, used to read from amongst the words of Abraham, that no man should commit fornication with a woman who hath an husband, that for him the punishment of death had been ordained in the heavens before the Most High Allah. And the sin will be recorded against him in the eternal books, continually before Ahaya. And Joseph remembered these words and refused to lie with her. And she besought him for a year, but he refused and would not listen. In the book of Joseph and Asana, Joseph also remembered the words of Jacob his father. In chapter 7 verse 6 it says, And Joseph kept his father Jacob's face before his eyes continually, and he remembered his father's commandments. For Jacob used to say to Joseph and his brothers, Be on your guard, my children, against a strange woman, and have nothing to do with her, for she is ruin and destruction. With this understanding, the children of Joseph had to be mindful not to make unions with idolatrous persons, both the sons and daughters of Joseph, because this tribe also struggles with marrying unrighteous people, like we see in the case of Ahab marrying Jezebel, the idolatrous woman. This is important for the children of Joseph to understand the repercussions of fornication because Fornication and adultery is common in the relationships among the children of Joseph. It will be helpful to also reference the lesson, the lust of the eyes, for edification on overcoming fornication. Now, touching back to Joseph and his reaction to being tempted with fornication. You see how Joseph was being prospered in righteousness. He wasn't eager through covetousness, as Naphtali forewarned in chapter 3, verse 1 but silent in purity of spirit to understand the will of Allah Hayyam, to hear the voice of his father and to not hearken to idols. Notice he didn't answer her a word. He just remembered what his father said to do and left, went to his chamber and prayed. And so you can see how the admonitions that were... Oh, he wept sorry. And prayed, so that shows you that it wasn't an easy task. It wasn't easy to overcome the fornication in your mind. It's not an easy thing. He literally had he literally was weeping and praying in the room trying to overcome it so it's a battle he did what naphtali had testified that children ought to do and can you read naphtali three and one please be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness or with vain words to beguile your souls because the woman spake the vain words to him about being a master over a house and whatnot. 
but he didn't give heed. Because if ye keep silence and purity of heart, ye shall understand how to hold fast the will of Allah and to cast away the will of Belia. The challenge of the mind, the fight he had to go through, not to give heed to the will of Belia. Continuing in Testament of Joseph, chapter 3, verse 4, please. And I fasted in those seven years, and I appeared to the Egyptians as one living delicately. For they that fast for Allah sake receive beauty of face. And we see that fasting with prayer is very powerful. Right? And Joseph practiced true fasting, which understanding is given in the Shepherd of Hermas, parable 5. I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, and chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. Please, you can just read through it. Please. Okay. The Shepherd of Hermas, parable 5, chapter 1. Verse 4. Alahayim desires not such a vain fast, for by so fasting unto Alahayim thou shalt do nothing for righteousness. But fast thou unto Alahayim such a fast as this. Do no wickedness in thy life, and serve Ahayah with a pure heart. Observe his commandments, and walk in his ordinances, and let no evil desire rise up in thy heart. But believe Alahayim. Then, if thou shalt do these things, and fear him, and control thyself from every evil deed, thou shalt live unto Allah. And if thou do these things, thou shalt accomplish a great fast, and one acceptable to Allah. Notice there, he did say control yourself, and that was Joseph's purpose of soul, to not admit any evil desire into his heart. You can see the true fast he was really working to overcome what the woman was attempting. All right, continue please. Shepherd of Hermas, parable 5, verse, chapter 3, verse 5. This fasting saith he, if the commandments of Ahayah are kept, is very good. This then is the way, that thou shalt keep this fast which thou art about to observe. First of all, keep thyself from every evil word and every evil desire. And purify thy heart from all the vanities of this world. If thou keep these things, this fast shall be perfect for thee. And thus shalt thou do, having fulfilled what is written on that day on which thou fastest, thou shalt taste nothing but bread and water. And from thy meat, which thou wouldest have eaten, thou shalt reckon up the amount of the day's expenditure, which thou wouldest have been cured, and shalt give it to a widow or an orphan, or to one in want, and so shalt thou humble thy soul, that he that hath received from thy humiliation may satisfy his own soul, and may pray for thee to a higher. If then thou shalt so accomplish this fast as I have commanded thee, thy sacrifice shall be acceptable in the sight of Allah, and this fasting shall be recorded in the service soul performed is beautiful and joyous and acceptable to Ahaya. And we have confirmation that Joseph practiced this type of fasting when you read Testament of Joseph, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, please. And if my master were away from home, I drank no wine. Nor for three days did I take my food, but I gave it to the poor and sick. And we see how the wisdom of Allah was with him right. from, from the, those times. Now, continuing and understanding Joseph here, <laughs> we have Joseph said, if my master were not away from home, I drank no wine. <laughs> so that lets you know when the master was home, Joseph, <laughs> he enjoyed drinking wine moderately. <laughs> and this is still consistent with the children of Joseph today. They enjoy drinking, kind of like the children of Judah. They, they, they're so tried, they just have a fondness of drink when done moderately. Naphtali talked about how doing things in orderliness and with prudence, right? Joseph walked in wisdom because he was prudent to know to do things in an orderly manner so he wouldn't drink at the wrong time or in the wrong season. Just as Natalie talked about not doing things out of season or in disorderliness. Right. So Joseph was paying attention and wouldn't drink because he knew that wine was a minister of fornication. And it would not be wise for him to be drinking 
in an environment where there's a woman trying to seduce him and her husband isn't there and it just uh, increases the chance that to uh, cause him to do something. And he knew himself, as Zach, well, you mentioned how he would go crying and praying. He knew that it was a struggle to overcome. Right. So he didn't want to put himself in a position where he would make himself susceptible to fall. You know what's interesting? This, off topic. Um, sure. Real quick. Um, this understanding from the Shepherd of Hermes is one of the only books that actually goes into what Joseph actually did. So it actually solidifies the Shepherd of Hermes as a true record. Absolutely. Gives understanding. Absolutely. Now, to the children of Joseph, well, they like wine as well. But sadly, when the children of Joseph are not walking in orderliness and walking in prudence, that disorderliness and lack of prudence causes them to get drunk excessively. Hence, today you can find among the children of Joseph a probability of having issues with drunkenness, whether they may be the types that get drunk to the point where they pass out or black out or getting drunk and, you know, getting into fights and things of that nature. From the scripture, it looks like being drunkards is more of an issue for Ephraim than it is Manasseh. When the scriptures testify of how this was a stumbling for them in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 1, please. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Ephraim's beauty was in humility and self-control. And that drunkenness through pride causes it to fade away. You can see the example of how when he was humble, he was exalted. When you read uh, Hosea 13 and 1, please. When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. As Naphtali testified as well, Joseph's children also have a problem with idolatry of the Gentiles. Hence, when Ephraim offended in Baal, he died. And we know that to be true from Jeroboam and Ahab, for example. And children of Ephraim have to be very mindful of these things. Pride and drunkenness is a stumbling block for the children of Ephraim today. And Ephraim's children excel when they walk in trembling. And you have that example in Joshua, Samuel, and even for Manasseh, Gideon. Fear of Elohim. Yes. Now let's look at how Joseph knew and understood not to drink wine when there was a temptation of fornication, using wisdom and doing things in their proper season, because wine can lead us astray. Look at the Testament of Judah, chapter 13, verse 1 to 8, please. And now, my children, I say unto you, be not drunk with wine. For wine turneth the mind away from the truth, and inspires the passion of lust, and leadeth the eyes into error. For the spirit of fornication hath wine as a minister to give pleasure to the mind. For these two also take away the mind of man. For if a man drink wine to drunkenness, it disturbeth the mind with filthy thoughts leading to fornication, and heateth the body to carnal union. And if the occasion of lust be present, he worketh the sin, it is not ashamed. Such is the inebrated man, my children. For he who is drunken reverences no man. For lo, it made me also to error. So I was not ashamed of the multitude in the city, and that before the eyes of all I turned aside unto Tamar, and I wrought a great sin. And I uncovered the covering of my son's shame. After I had drunk wine, I reverenced not the commandment of Elohim. And I took a woman of Canaan to wife. For much discretion needeth the man who drinketh wine, my children. And herein is discretion in drinking wine. A man may drink so long as he preserveth modesty. That's an admonition for all who have a fondness of wine. It's, it's okay to drink so long as you're able to preserve modesty. And we see why Joseph was walking in discretion to know don't drink when your master is not home because of the 
struggle within against fornication. Don't want to put yourself in a position where you're going to fall. Testament to Joseph, chapter 4, verse 1. Yeah, now we got to see the admonition for his sons to see how you can be attacked by the spirit of fornication in different ways to understand and, and avoid it. Also, when the children of Joseph are overcome with the wicked desire, how this woman is acting is how the children of Joseph act when they're trying to seduce someone unto fornication. Often, therefore, did she flatter me with words as a holy man, and guilefully in her talk praised my chastity before her husband, while desiring to ensnare me when we were alone. For she lauded me openly as chaste, and in secret she said unto me, Fear not my husband, but he is persuaded concerning thy chastity. But even should one tell him concerning us, he would not believe. Now that's tough. Yes. Yeah, so. that, that really helps you see how you have to be mindful of those that are very um, officious and seem and very flattering. And don't know what they're really seeking to do behind the scenes. Male or female, right? Owing to all these things, I lay upon the ground and besought Elohim that Ahia would deliver me from her deceit. See how Joseph was fighting? He really he was fighting to overcome it. And when she had prevailed nothing thereby, she came again to me under the plea of instruction. That she might learn the words of Elohim. And she said unto me, Thou willest that I should leave my idols, lie with me, and I will persuade my husband to depart from his idols, and we will walk in the law of thy Adonai. We see, even in this walk of the gospel, the spirit of fornication still attacks people, and one has to be very mindful. People can even come seeking instruction, using it for a means to get close. So we have to be on guard at all times against that spirit of fornication. All right, she was going to use what he was into. She was trying to find an avenue to get him to get comfortable, to lighten up, you know, to get off guard so that she could do what she wanted to do. And I said unto her, Ahia willeth not that those who reverence him should be in uncleanness, nor doeth he take pleasure in them that commit adultery, but in those that approach him with a pure heart and undefiled lips. That pure heart and undefiled lips comes from being silent in purity of heart, waiting to know the will of Elohim just as Naphtali commanded, so you children of Joseph can see your father is instructing you to be that way. And to know that you and Naphtali's children have some similarities and also some similar cures to overcome your struggles. But she held her peace, longing to accomplish her evil desire. And I gave myself yet more to fasting and prayer that Ahia might deliver me from her. Well, you see, as her tax increased, he increased in his righteousness. And again, at another time, she said unto me, if thou would not commit adultery, I will kill my husband by poison, and take thee to be my husband. I therefore, when I heard this, ripped my garments and said unto her, Woman, reverence Allah, and do not this evil deed, lest thou be destroyed. But know indeed that I would declare this thy device unto all men. She therefore, being afraid, besought that I would not declare this device. And she departed soothing me with gifts and sending me every delight of the sons of men. Or you can use it for exhortation about the sons of Joseph to always cleave unto righteousness. And according to the law, if you hear a false matter, you have to proclaim it. So Joseph would write and saying, if thou do it, I'm going to proclaim it to everybody that you did it. It wasn't going to keep it a secret and be a part of her evil deed so you can see the righteousness that was in Joseph's heart right having the fear of Allah before his eyes as he admonished his children thank you and afterwards she sent me food mingled with enchantments 
And when the eunuch who brought it came, I looked up and beheld a terrible man given me with this dish of sword. And I perceived that her scheme was to beguile me. And when he had gone out, I wept. Nor did I taste that or any other of her food. So then after one day she came to me and observed the food and said unto me, Why is it that thou hast not eaten of the food? And I said unto her, It is because thou hast filled it with deadly enchantments. And how saidest thou, I come not near to idols, but to Ahia alone. Now therefore know that the Elohim of my father hath revealed unto me by his angel thy wickedness, and I have kept it to convict thee, if haply thou mayest see and repent. But that thou mayest learn that the wickedness of the unholy hath no power over them that worship Elohim with chastity. Behold, I will take of it and eat before thee. And having so said, I prayed thus, The Elohim of my fathers and the angel of Abraham be with me, and ate. And when she saw this, she fell upon her face at my feet, weeping. And I raised her up and admonished her, and she promised to do this iniquity no more. But her heart was still set upon evil, and she looked around how to ensnare me. And sighing deeply, she became downcast though she was not sick. And when her husband saw her, he said unto her, Why is thy countenance fallen? And she said unto him, I have a pain in my heart, and the groanings of my spirit oppress me. And so he comforted her who was not sick. Then accordingly, seizing an opportunity, she rushed unto me while her husband was yet without, and said unto me, I will hang myself. I cast myself over a cliff, that thou would not lie with me. And when I saw the spirit of Belial was troubling her, I prayed unto Ahia and said unto her, Why, wretched woman, art thou troubled and disturbed, blinded through sins? Remember that thou killed thyself, Asdale, the concubine of thy husband, thy rival, will beat thy children, and thou would destroy thy memorial from off the earth. And she said unto me, Lo, then thou lovest me. Let this suffice me. Only strive for my life and my children. And I expect that I shall enjoy my desire also. But she knew not that because of my master I spake thus, and not because of her. For if a man have fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, even as she... Whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view of his wicked desire. One may wonder why Joseph went at length to explain everything this woman did and how she was acting being overcome with her desire. Naphtali said, The children ought to be mindful not to corrupt their doings through covetousness. Joseph explained all this because this is how the children of Joseph act and overcome with their desire, trying to seduce the opposite sex unto fornication. We have to be very mindful, afraid of fornication, that evil desire can lead people a real wrong way. If you have anything, please add. Well, it. it says, For if a man have fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view to his wicked desire. And so and nowadays, they may hear something and they take it how they wanted it to be. And that wasn't necessarily how it was meant or how it was said. So you take it in your mind and you, you conceive it to be what you wanted it to be not actually what it was it's like a false reality interesting that the, he was specific of wicked desire because that wicked desire as you explain it can pertain to anything right yeah it's not just, that's what i was saying just I, not fornication. right it, right that's, he went into detail about that for a reason and i think it goes back to naphtali speaking of corrupting their doings through covetousness the children of Joseph, when they hear something, they speak vain words 
to themselves beguiling their own souls because it's not what the person is actually saying but they're hearing what they want to hear all right uh chapter 8 verse 1 i declare therefore unto you my children that it was about the sixth hour when she departed from me and i knelt before ahia all day and all the night and about dawn i rose up weeping the well and praying for a release from her at last then she laid hold of my garments forcibly dragging me to have connection with her when therefore i saw that in her madness she was holding fast to my garments i left her behind and fled away naked and holding fast to the garment she falsely accused me and when her husband came he cast me into prison in his house and on the morrow he scourged me and sent me into pharaoh's prison and when I was in bonds, the Egyptian woman was oppressed with grief, and she came and heard how I gave thanks unto Ahia, and sang praises in the abode of darkness, and with glad voice rejoiced, glorifying my Elohim that I was delivered from the lustful desire of the Egyptian woman. And often have she sent unto me, saying, I'm sent to fulfill my desire, and I will release thee from thy bonds, and I will free thee from the darkness. And not even in thought did I incline unto her. For Allah loveth him who in a den of wickedness combines fasting with chastity, rather than the man who in king's chambers combines luxury with license. And if a man liveth in chastity, and desireth also glory, and the Most High knoweth that it is expedient for him, he bestoweth this also upon me. And you notice that Joseph said, not even in thought did I decline unto her. Because it's a battle within for the children of Joseph. And also we see, Ahia giveth a man what's needful for him. And there you see how Joseph really didn't walk according to his own mind. He brought to a place where he trusted and was content with whatever the will of Allah was. Walking in orderliness, just as the body. As Nathalie testified, how the body has certain functions. Everyone's content with that role in the body. I'm going to touch on this. It says, For Allah loveth sure. him, who in a den of wickedness combines fasting with chastity. So when you're surrounded by things that are not good, you, you go into fasting and chastity. Then it says, Rather than the man who in king's chambers combines luxury with license. So when you're in the midst of iniquity and you're prospering with luxury, he said, who combines luxury with license, because the license is a license to sin, as preceptually is stated. Now, when you combine luxury with license to sin, that's a lot of times what a lot of people fall into. They might be doing well, they might be doing well off, or they might think that Allah is prospering them, and they will start sinning and start justifying their sin because of the prosperity that Allah is granting unto them. And that's one of the things that Joseph was admonishing us not to fall into. Because you start going away from Allah, you start fleeing away from him, and you start walking not in the fear of Allah like Joseph, how he actually humbled himself. The opposite would be to lift yourself up. Did you find the precept on license to sin? It was Sirach 15 and 10 where it said, He hath commanded no man to do wickedly, neither hath he given any man license to sin. The license to sin is breaking the commandment and justifying it. Like, I'm going to do this, and I know that a higher is going to have grace for me. That's a justification of breaking the commandment. All right. Do you have anything else there? Nope. See you when you're ready, please. How often, though she were sick, did she come down to me at unlooked for times, and listened to my voice as I prayed? And when I heard her groanings, I held my peace. But when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms, and breasts, and legs, that I might lie with her. But she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned in order to beguile me. Sadly, this is something you can find the children of Joseph doing. It's pretty common that they dress in a manner where they have their chest out or their 
exposing their beauty of form in order to attract another or get attention from another or turn another into fornication. In the higher guard, I mean, from her devices. And we see again, he understood and trusted Ahaya to defend him from her attempts because she was attacking his senses so that fornication may find place in his mind to lead him astray. And she was showing her legs and showing her features and whatnot to try to just corrupt his mind. Remember, the spirit of fornication is seated in the senses as Rubens showed. So we see how the spirit of fornication was working against Joseph to overcome his mind to cause him to fall. Yet he knew that it was Ahaya that guarded him from her devices, which again, notice how Joseph speaks of what Ahaya did for him didn't speak of it as it was something he did on his own. He was really very humble. Right? He did not glory in his own strength or in himself. Uh, continue, please. You see, therefore, my children, that how great things patient work is and prayer with fasting. So ye too, if ye follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, Ahia would dwell among you because he loveth chastity. Uh, be comforted, sons of Joseph, because he said if you follow after it, so you keep striving towards it, even as your father. As Zachua mentioned, he was, you see, he was crying, praying, trying to overcome. He was laying on the floor all night trying to overcome. He was persistent in it. He didn't give up in the trial to succumb to it and just accept the spirit in and let it rule him. Be encouraged so that though the spirits might attack, the key is don't give in. And if you fall, confess your fault and get back in the fight to stand aloof from it. All right. Even though envy or slavery or slander befall of a man, a higher who dwelleth in him for the sake of his chastity not only delivers him from evil, but also exalteth him even as me. For in every way the man is lifted up, whether in deed or in word or in thought. My brother knew how my father loved me. And yet I did not exalt myself in my mind. Although I was a child, I had the fear of Elohim in my heart, for I knew that all things would pass away, and did not raise myself against them with evil intent, but I honored my brethren. He did what was right, contrary to what his children would do. His children would exalt themselves in their mind. They would have an issue with high-mindedness. They would think less of others, even. Causing them to look at others in scorn, looking down upon them like Naphtali talked about. Have to be mindful of doing things with evil intent. Be on God not to exalt oneself in one's mind, but to do all things with good intent in the fear of Allah. The fear of Allah is very key for you, sons of Joseph, with, and doing all things with a good heart. And honor, and that will lead on to the honor of brethren rather than falling into envy. Right? right? The struggle in Joseph's children, they struggle with so with enmity between brethren. Because Joseph honored his brothers. He loved his brothers. His children struggle with actually doing that. That's why in the scriptures you see beef between Joseph's children and also Joseph's children envying other tribes like Judah and Levi. And today you'll find they have a whether it be hatred between brethren or brethren envying each other or being high-minded towards each other. It's a struggle they have within their families today. And to overcome this, Joseph gives the instruction. Can you read Joseph? Chapter 11, verse 1, please. Do ye also, my children, have the fear of Allah in your works before your eyes, and honor your brethren. For everyone that doeth the law of Ahiah shall be loved by him. But there's the admonition of your father to honor each other. In doing so, you'll actually be doing the law because you know the law says love your neighbor as yourself. All right. Continue reading. Uh, Testament of Joseph, please. And when I came to the end of Copiate with the Ishmaelites, they asked me, saying, Art thou a slave? And I said that I was a home-born slave, that I might not put my brother into shame. And the eldest of them said unto me, Thou art not a slave, but even thy appearance do with make it manifest. But I said that I was their slave. Now when we came into Egypt, they strove concerning me, 
which of them should buy me and take me? Therefore it seemed good to all that I should remain in Egypt with the merchant of their trade, until they should return bringing merchandise. And Ahiah gave me favor in the eyes of the merchant. And he entrusted unto me his house, and Elohim blessed him by my means, and increased him in gold and silver, and in household servants. And I was with him three months and five days. And about that time, the Memphrian woman, the wife of Pentrithri, came down in the chariot with great pomp, because she had heard from her eunuchs concerning me. And she told her husband that the merchant had become rich by means of a young Hebrew. And they say that he had assuredly been stolen out of the land of Canaan. Now therefore render justice unto him, and take away the youth from thy house. So shall the Elohim of the Hebrews bless thee, for grace from heaven is upon him. And Pentrippus was persuaded by her words, and commanded the merchant to be brought, and said unto him, what is this I hear concerning thee, that thou stillest persons out of the land of Canaan, and sellest them for slaves? But the merchant fell at his feet, and besought him, saying, I beseech thee, my master, I know not what thou sayest. And Pentrippus said unto him, Whence then is the Hebrew slave? And he said, The Ishmaelites entrusted him unto me until they should return. But he believed him not, but commanded him to be stripped and beaten. And when he persisted in this statement, Pentrippus said, Let the youth be brought. And when I was brought in, I did obeisance to Pentephras, for he was third in rank of the officers of Pharaoh. And he took me apart from him, and said unto me, Art thou a slave or free? And I said, A slave. And he said, Whose? And I said, The Ishmaelites. And he said, how didst thou become their slave? And I said, They brought me out of the land of Canaan. And he said unto me, Truly thou liest. And straightway he commanded me to be stripped and beaten. And he saying, Thy judgment is unjust, for thou doest punish a free man who hath been stolen, as, as though he were a transgressor. And when I made no change in my statement, though I was beaten, he ordered me to be in prison until he said the owners of the boy should come. And the woman said unto her husband, Wherefore doest thou detain the captive and well-born lad in bonds, who ought rather to be set at liberty and be waited upon? For she wished to see me out of a desire of sin, but I was ignorant concerning all these things. And she said, And he said to her, it is not the custom of the Egyptians to take that which belongeth to others before proof is given. This therefore he said concerning the merchant, but as for the lad, he must be in prison. Now after four and twenty days came the Ishmaelites, for they had heard that Jacob my father was mourning much concerning me. And they said, I mean, and they came and said unto me, How is it that thou saidest that thou wast a slave, and lo, we have learnt that thou art the son of a mighty man in the land of Canaan, and thy father still mourneth for thee in sackcloth and ashes. When I heard this, my bowels were dissolved, and my heart melted, and I desired greatly to weep, but I restrained myself, that I should not put my brother into shame. And I said unto them, I know not, I am a slave. Then therefore they took counsel to sell me, that I should not be found in their hands. For they feared my father, lest he should come and execute upon them a grievous vengeance. For they had heard that he was mighty with Allah and with men. Then said the merchant unto them, Release me from the judgment of Pentrope. And they came and requested me, saying, Say that thou wast brought by us with money, and he will set us free. Now the Memphian woman said to her husband, Buy the youth, for I hear, said she, that they are selling him. And straightway she sent a eunuch to the Ishmaelites and asked them to sell me. But since the eunuch would not agree to buy me at their price, he returned, having made trial of them. And he made known to his mistress that they asked a large price for the slave. She sent another eunuch, saying, Even though they demand two minute, minutes, give them. Do not spare the gold. Only buy the boy and bring him to me. The eunuch therefore went and gave him eighty pieces of gold, and he received me. 
But the Egyptian woman, he said, I had given a hundred, and though I knew this, I held my peace. Is the eunuch to be put to shame? Joseph went into all of this to explain how he went through so much and still concealed the downfalls or the shortcomings of his brethren out of love towards his brethren so that his sons can understand how they ought to operate. Because among the sons of Joseph today, they have issues with being busybodies or slanderers of one another. Through the scorn and hatred among brethren envying one another. Hence, they'll be quick to utter their brother's fault. If their brothers make a mistake, they'll be ready to declare it to everyone and want to see them punished for it. As uh, when you read the Testament of God, it tells about how the spirit of hatred works in that way. That also helps their high-mindedness, too, when they're in iniquity, because they will proclaim the faults of their brethren to exalt themselves. Right. You see, therefore, my children, what great things I endured that I should not put my brethren to shame. Do ye also, therefore, love one another, and with long suffering hide ye one another's faults? For Allah I am delighted in the unity of brethren and in the purpose of a heart that takes pleasure in love. Right. The great admonition, not only for Joseph's children, but for us all. Love one another with long suffering. Hide you one another's faults. So that shows you don't hide it and still be bitter about it, but actually be merciful, actually be forgiven towards one another and also hide one another's faults. And that will bring about unity of brethren. Joseph mentioned how wicked desire can lead a person to hear things how they want to hear it. And now we see how once that your purpose of heart is because you have a pleasure in love, you actually want to see things come together. That fruits of the spirit is what is bringing the whole house of Abraham, Jew and Gentile together. The purpose of heart in love, actually wanting to see things go well, wanting there to be unity. Instead of looking for one's own desire or walking according to the wicked desire, which causes one to hear what one wants to hear. Now, we're not saying to conceal somebody's sins. Now, if somebody's operating in iniquity, that's different than somebody making a mistake and, yes. and overseeing their fault. So we just want to make sure we're not telling the children of Joseph or any man to, to overlook somebody's iniquity. But telling you to forgive somebody that makes a mistake. Thank you for clarifying that. And case in point, he said faults. He didn't say iniquity. Because of the other woman, she was about to commit iniquity and kill her husband. And he wasn't going to hide it. He told her he was going to tell everybody. Because he wasn't going to consent onto a transgression. There's a difference with faults. Things that are done in ignorance and whatnot. We do it out of love for brethren. So Joseph has munitions, so we make sure we understand it right. Um, Want me to continue? Yes, please. And when my brethren came into Egypt, they learned that I had returned their money unto them, and unbraided them not, and comforted them. And after the death of Jacob, my father, I loved them more abundantly. And all things, whatsoever he commanded, I did very abundantly for them. And I suffered them not to be afflicted in, a, in the smallest matter. And all that was in my hand I gave unto them. And their children were my children, and my children at their servants. And their life was my life. And all their suffering was my suffering, and all their sickness was my infirmity. My land was their land, and their counsel my counsel. And I exalted not myself among them in arrogance because of my worldly glory but i was among them as one of the least so joseph children have to be mindful of self-exaltation and arrogance and you see how joseph really prospered in brotherly love you see how he acted toward his brethren so joseph children have to be very much aware of that um, enmity between brethren and to really cleave to the love of the brethren and that is attained as he showed through humility. He walked as one of the least, through the yoke of Yache, being meek and lowly of heart. Continue, please. If ye also therefore walk in the commandments of Ahiah, my children, he will exalt you there. 
and will bless you with good things forever and ever. And if anyone seeketh to do evil unto you, do well unto them, and pray for them, and you shall be redeemed of Ahiah from all evil. Joseph really had the spirit of Allah Hayyam. That's what Yache said to do. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse to you. And so on and so forth. So Joseph's children can overcome and by not rendering evil for evil. That's actually the love of the gospel. So Joseph is teaching his children how to have that blessing upon their head to walk in, in these admonitions of their father. Joseph also admonishes his children through his own actions how his sons ought to take wives in the fear of Allah Hayyam. Continue, please. But well, behold, you see that out of my humility and long suffering, I took unto me the daughter of the priest of Heliopolis. And there's a proper way through humility and long suffering, doing things the right way. And Reuben also testified of it. So you can see how Joseph strove against fornication. And also he did not suffer that spirit of fornication to cause him to error in his selection of a wife either. And Reuben gave understanding how that ought to be done as well. And uh, can you read that testament of Reuben chapter 4 verse 1 please? Pay no heed therefore my children to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs, but walk in singleness of heart in the fear of Ahiah, and expend labor on good works, and on study, and on your flocks. Until Ahaya give you a wife, whom he will, that ye suffer not as I did. So we see Joseph's children need to take heed to these things so that they don't fall to marrying for the wrong reasons, particularly marrying for lust. As we know from the Testaments that Naphtali and Joseph are very similar. Tobias was a righteous example of how one should take a wife for righteousness, not for the sake of lust. Can you read Tobit chapter 8 verse 7? Please. This is when Tobias was praying when he got his wife. And now, O oh Lord, I take not this my sister for lust, but uprightly. Therefore, mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. Joseph children have to be mindful of that, not to get united with idolatrous women or for lust. Like, for example, Ahab taking Jezebel for a wife. She was an idolatrous woman and she caused a lot of sin, and she led him to commit a lot of sin. Continuing in Testament of Joseph, chapter 18, verse 3, please. And a hundred talents of gold were given me with her, and I had made them to serve me. And he gave me also beauty as a flower beyond the beautiful ones of Israel. And he preserved me unto old age and strength and in beauty, because I was like in all things to Jacob. You see, just like Naphtali, as Deuteronomy 33 and 23 said, Naphtali, oh, satisfied with favor. Those two tribes, Joseph and Naphtali, are out of all the tribes. They are the most attractive. And evidently, Joseph had beauty of, <laughs> beyond the beautiful ones of Israel. So, Of the sons of Jacob, he was the most comely. Uh, we see what prospered him, the righteousness, cleaving unto the fear of Allah, the purity, the chastity, the endurance. That was beautiful in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And it's interesting, he said he was like in all things to Jacob. To see the righteousness that was in our father as well, that passed down to his children. All through our Lord Yache. All right. Testament of Joseph, chapter 19, verse 1. Well, you see, Joseph and Naphtali, they both had the gift of visions. So you can find it amongst the tribes. With this one... We went over this in the two witnesses lesson. So, brother and sister, you can visit that lesson to get the understanding of this vision also. We're going to go ahead and read through it, though. To complete it, and maybe something Ahaya may enlighten on at this time. Testament of Joseph, chapter 19, verse 1. Hear ye therefore, me vision which I saw. I saw twelve hearts feeding, and nine of them were dispersed. Now the three were preserved. But on the following day, they also were dispersed. And I saw that the three hearts became three lambs. And they cried to Ahiah, and he brought them forth into a flourishing and well-watered place. Yea, he brought them out of darkness into light. And there they cried unto Ahiah until they gathered together unto them the nine hearts. And they became as twelve sheep. And after a little time, they increased and became many flocks. 
Oh, and after these things I saw, and behold, twelve bulls were sucking one cow, which produced a sea of milk. The twelve bulls are the twelve tribes. The one cow is the church, the lamb's wife. And the sea of milk is the milk of the word going forth from her to teach all her children of all nations. And there drink thereof the twelve flocks and innumerable herds. There you see the twelve flocks are the hundred and forty-four thousand of the house of Israel. There's an innumerable multitude and an innumerable number of Gentiles that are going to receive the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes when the preaching of the two witnesses come to pass. And the horns of the fourth bull went up unto heaven, and became as a wall for the flocks. The fourth bull is Judah. The head of that bull is Christ, the king, the head of the house of Judah. And the two horns on his head are the two witnesses that he's empowering to preach in these end times. Those two witnesses are going to go up, as seen in the book of Revelations 11, and they're going to pray for the flock. That's how there'll be a wall for the flock by the power of prayer and in the midst of the two horns there grew another horn just like in the exodus as there was one in the midst of the two witnesses joshua the son of joseph of the tribe of ephraim and the end times again is going to come to pass there'll be a man of the house of joseph that will be risen up that yahshua used to guide the people here in these end times as well because the end is going to be just like the exodus Therefore, you see that third horn that came up out of the midst of the two. You know Joseph is a part of it as well from the vision of Naphtali. When Joseph took hold of that bull that had the eagle's wings and rode upon it and prospered. And that all it shows is Yachi that prospers Joseph. That bull was Yachi that he rode upon. So it's consistent to see that it's Yachi that's blessing the house of Joseph and, and having mercy upon them as the firstborn. So that his children may always know and trust and rejoice and yacha and have no confidence in the flesh because we are israelites or in themselves in any way and i saw a bull calf was surrounded them 12 times and it became a help to the bulls holy and i saw in the midst of the horns a virgin wearing a many colored garment and from her went forth a lamb and on his right was as it were a lion all the the beasts and all the reptiles rushed against him and the lamb overcame them and destroyed them. And the bulls rejoiced because of him, and the cow and the ten hearts exalted together with him. And these things must come to pass in their season. Do ye therefore, my children, observe the commandments of Ahia and honor Levi and Judah? For from them shall arise unto you the lamb of Elohim, who taketh away the sin of the world. One will save of all the Gentiles and Israel. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away. But my kingdom among you shall come to an end as a watcher's hammock, which after the summer disappeared. So from the vision, you can see why he admonished his children to follow Judah and Levi. He understood this vision was of the end times. He knew that there would be the two horns that will come to bring the people together. As it said in the blessings of Joseph, he has horns as the horns of a unicorn, and with his horns he shall gather the people together to the ends of the earth. He understood that those two horns will gather the people together, and he also seen through the vision that there will be one of his seed that comes up through the midst of the horns. So he admonished his children to cleave to Judah and Levi because he knew what will come hand to end. So... For children of Joseph, your father saw what's coming and giving you the admonition so that you be not left behind and without understanding. All right, continue, please. I know that after my death, the Egyptians will afflict you, the Allahim will avenge you, and will bring you into that which he promised to your fathers, that you shall carry up my bones with you. But when my bones are being taken up thither, I shall be with you in light. And Belier shall be in darkness with the Egyptians. And carry ye up Ashnet, your mother, to the Hippodrome. And near Rachel, your mother, bury her. And when he had said these things, he stretched out his feet and died at a good old age. And all Israel mourned for him, and all Egypt, with a great mourning. And when the children of Israel went out of Egypt, they took with them the bones of Joseph. And they buried him in Hebron with his fathers. And the years of his life were 110 years.
All right. Testament of Joseph. <laughs> a long one. <laughs> yeah, Joseph had a lot of information in there. Yeah. Hopefully it was edifying. I'm going to check YouTube real quick. For one moment. All right. All right. Shout out to Tom, everybody. Say hi to keep you all and bless you all. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed the lesson. Um, what's the next tribe? Issachar. Oh. Issachar and then probably Zebulon. That should be good. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. All right. So, well, we definitely bless everybody with a happy Shabbat. We know everything that's going on in the world right now. We just definitely keep everybody in our prayers. Make sure you keep us in your prayers. And um, may I you deliver us in due time. May we not trust in our own strength. We give all glory to the Father, Haya Asherea Haya, and the Son, Yache Mashiaka Ardono, and the Mother Ruaka Kodoshi. Praise you and we bless you. In the name of Ahaya. Uh, you got anything, Kafa? Praise Ahaya. Hit you all next week. We didn't bring it up. Did everybody see Kafa the Afro? <laughs> 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 hey man, this was a, a last minute hairdo, man. I, the, the other hairdo was rough. I couldn't come on here with those braids, man. The braids were big and clunky, man. I wasn't going to have you making fun of me, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shout out to Tyler, everybody. Pray the higher for good works. Peace be unto you all. Enjoy your Shabbat day.